12.7 million people are physically abused, raped, or stalked by their partners in one year. That's approximately the population of New York City and Los Angeles combined. That's 24 people every minute. We are Pangea A representatives from Middle College High School and our goal is to share stories about survivors who have overcome abuse. We're currently on our way to review two members of Rainbow Services, one who is also a survivor of domestic violence. And some of our participants got to do both the before and after, what the abuse was like. So you can see in the middle how it's a lot brighter. So those participants were asked, you know, what's your message of hope or how did you overcome the abuse? And then on the outside, we asked them to detect what was it like during the abuse. So um, I held my breath for about a month and a half as this was being done. And once we put it all together, I was just like blown away. Saturday was just like, you know, name calling, maybe jealousy, and then it started like with heating and punching and, and all of that. So um, by the time I know uh, years passed and I was in this relationship, but then I had children and I was like, you know, too afraid to leave or to leave. In the beginning, everything started with verbal and emotional abuse. There was naming, uh, name calling, yelling, um, different things that I knew I didn't like. I felt they weren't okay, but I didn't really get that it was abusive. I didn't get that it was it was an unhealthy relationship. And as things started to get physical, I still don't think in that moment that I really that I really got what was going on. But I let's see. Um, I was emotionally abused by both of my parents from really as long as I can remember. When I was seven years old, uh, my father took me into his bedroom, loaded a gun in front of me and put it to my head. It was a punishment for something. I don't even really remember what it was for, but that really changes the way you process the world. Domestic violence is a pattern of behavior that establishes power and control over another person through fear, intimidation, and violence. Abuse can happen to anyone regardless of gender, race, sexual orientation, or income. One in four experience domestic violence during their lifetime. Domestic abuse is the third leading cause of homelessness among families according to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development.
Victims face depression, sleep disturbances, anxiety, flashbacks, and emotional distress. Most women brought to emergency rooms due to domestic violence are socially isolated and had few social and financial resources. Kennedy. Anaya. Elmer. Nikki. Jackie. Jackie. All right. Thanks for sitting on the Jackie side. <laughs> That'll be easy. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. What is your name? I'm Elizabeth Eastland. And how long have you been a director of Rainbow Services? I've been the director of programs for almost nine years, nine years. Okay. in April. What inspired you to be an advocate against abuse? Um, so when I first started at Rainbow, previous to Rainbow, I worked in the fields of substance abuse, mental health, working with people who are living with HIV and AIDS. And the homeless populations and one thing I noticed was that a lot of people that I was working with had experienced or witnessed domestic violence at an early age so I and I wanted the opportunity to work with um, more women and children I never really worked for an organization that primarily served children as well so and I felt in working in homelessness that there's there's a lack of hope yeah. in people and that we need to do a better job with kids at an early age who've experienced abuse to hopefully prevent homelessness, substance abuse, and all of the other fields I was working in. So when the opportunity came up at Rainbow, I, I wanted to try that. What can Rainbow Services provide for survivors of abuse? Mm -hmm. So we're, we've been around for about 32 years, and we this is our community resource center and we provide support groups, individual counseling, advocacy through our case management program and legal services. And then we also have a 24 hour hotline where people can call 24 hours a day to get advice or to seek shelter. We have an emergency shelter program where people can go who are fleeing a violent situation and need immediate shelter. And then we also have a transitional housing program where families can stay for up to 12 months while they put their lives back together. And in that program, they're really working towards attaining an educational or occupational goal so that they can then become self-sufficient. Um, if you had a friend that you thought was going through a domestic violence situation, what exactly um, could you say to them? Mm -hmm. That there, well, that there are, there is help out there, and I think I, well, what I did in the past was just really talking to them about what might help them in that situation. Like, would they be willing to see a counselor or talk to someone, especially if they didn't want to talk to me about it, even though I knew things were happening, you know, and just educating them about what the resources are. That are our hotline is three one zero five four seven. 9343. So anyone can call that number if they're just looking for resources, whether it's in our area or anywhere around Los Angeles, because we're part of a network of shelters so that we share information with the other domestic violence shelters throughout Los Angeles County. So depending on where they're at, we can refer them or provide them with information about shelters or services in their area. What is your name? Hi, my name is Maria. Maria, how old are you? I'm 60. Yes. Who do you live with? Um, just by myself with my cousin. Uh, do you have any children? Yes, I have two. Two? They're yeah. all grown. Girl, yeah. Okay. And gone. <laughs> when did you when when did you meet your partner and how? Uh, this is uh, back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, so I was a victim of domestic violence back in the time. Uh, and now I'm a survivor, so, and I work with uh, victims. How did the abuse make you feel? Did it make you feel small, unwanted, useless, controlled? All of the above. Um, yeah. yeah. Were your friends or and family aware of what was going on? No, it's something that I kept from, and because I moved from my country, so I had no friends, and my family, I would not tell them, so I wouldn't even visit, if I have any bruises, I wouldn't visit them, so I was isolated, so yeah, they, nobody knew. Did you ever think that the abuse would end? 
uh, yeah, I have faith, and then just remember that this was a person that I love, and I marry, so I have faith that, you know, if I do this or that, so it's going to change. So, yeah, I was almost sure that with all the faith that I have, that he was going to change, and, you know, like, I was going to live happy with that person. So, yeah, I really thought that he was going to change. I think it reached a point where I wasn't happy anymore and I started working because before that I was just a uh, housewife so I don't have any connections with people but once I started working uh, I started like thinking like I can do it by myself, I can do it by myself, I can, you know I started thinking more about being independent so that depends so much on him and so I started asking questions and then I was going to school at the time to learn English so uh, People tell me, like, yeah, you don't have to take the abuse. You don't, and People from other states reached out to us because abuse isn't only a problem in our community. It's a national problem. Um, can we go on to your story? Um, Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so can you share with the viewers and everybody who's going to be watching this what your story is, who you are? Okay. Um, okay, my name is Melanie Blow. But I, let's see, um, I was emotionally abused by both of my parents from really as long as I can remember. When I was seven years old, uh, my father took me into his bedroom, loaded a gun in front of me and put it to my head. Um, prior to the abuse, were you afraid of your father? And I was afraid of my father, yeah, forever. He's just, yeah, he's just one of those people who was big into authority and what he consider you know, what he considers to be respect is what most people consider fear. Same with my mother. Did you ever like attend any shelters or you know, groups, no. support groups? Um, as an adult, yes. As an adult, support groups have been a big issue. As a kid, I never wanted I I never tried to get outside authorities involved. I have a little sister. I was very worried about leaving her alone. Um, so I, that was another reason I never looked for help. And I just, I mean, I graduated from high school living with my family. I went through college. And college was really where I was able to emotionally break my ties with my family to a large extent. And I was able to earn a living wage when I graduated from college and be, so was able to be financially independent. Well, how successful has Stop Abuse Campaign been with rehabilitating the survivors of abuse? Um, our biggest thing, like, our biggest work we do is with pu is public policy. So, I mean, my boss Andrew Willis had a job where he was earning seven a seven figure income a year and wasn't getting any healthier. He's you know, he runs a not-for-profit now, which is not any at all something you do if you want to make money. And he's enjoying his life a lot more. I'm enjoying my life a lot more. Um, we always see, um, I'm trying to think of a good way to put this. We publish a lot of stories about abuse and a lot of blogs and things like that. And we'll always get somebody who will email or respond on Facebook saying, I never thought about it that way, but I, I understand part of my life so much better now, or I understand my kid's life so much better now, or I never understood that what I was going through was abuse. So um, is there any advice that you would give to, you know, people who are in these situations now? Yeah, um, it gets better. I mean, just life Life will get better. You're not always going to be a kid. What you're going through won't go away, and it won't stop affecting you, but you can live a good life. Um, and that part's really gratifying, because we see through that we touch thousands and thousands of people's lives, and that's very, that's very gratifying. And... Getting a bill passed is something that's difficult to do. You don't get, you don't get to see that every day, but that's when it does happen. That's enormously gratifying because then you know you've changed the world, and 
something that a, a broken system that lets thousands of kids get hurt is start working now. That's also enormously gratifying. What's your name? My name is Shannon. How old are you? I am 31. Well, how did you meet your partner? I met him through a mutual friend. Uh, we actually started out by talking on the phone. It was uh, our friend decided that we would probably get along and we should talk. Um, so he called, we started talking, and before I knew it, we were talking what seemed what felt like all day, every day. And a couple months later, we actually got to meet in person. At the time, he was living in a different state. Uh, we met in person, and then things just happened from there. So when did your unsteady relationship start? Um, knowing what I know now from the, the classes I've taken and the support groups that I've been in, it really started from day one. The signs were there. Um, and that is one, what I recognize, one of the biggest problems is that too many of us are unaware of what an abusive relationship is, how it works, and what the warning signs are. As things started to get physical, I still don't think in that moment that I really, that I really got what was going on. Um, you know, the times that he hit me, I, I knew he had no right to hit me. Um, I knew I didn't like the way I felt emotionally when, when it was happening. And I, I don't think it was until I, I asked for help, until I reached out and I found the support groups, and even in the support groups that I really connected the dots and I realized this was abuse. It wasn't. My advice for anyone who is in an abusive relationship, number one, you have to recognize the signs. You have to know the difference between a healthy and unhealthy relationship. If you are starting to notice that you have knots in your stomach when you even think about the person you you get anxious when you get a phone call you you notice that you're panicked about things and you're you're worried about making mistakes doing things wrong if you ever feel any fear around this person or just thinking about them most likely you're in an abusive relationship and the first thing for you to do after recognizing that is to seek help seek help in any way you can whether it's through a friend a family member there are organizations out here plenty of organizations who are ready and willing to help they have support groups they have shelters they have anything you need to get the resources you need to get out safely and to stay out of the relationship if you need help from law enforcement please don't hesitate they're there to help and your safety is more important than anything else. Reach out whenever you know that you're in need. Where are you now? And what is your current situation? Oh, I am happy. I work at Rainbow Services, actually. And uh, I, I'm very happy with my life and I'm happy with the life that I gave my children. I am back in college. I am working towards a degree in business, um, helping my daughters with their schooling. We're making sure to, to focus a lot on their social emotional development. I have them in schools that I know will support them and give them what they need and help them learn early on how to have healthy relationships. I'm also volunteering with Rainbow Services, the organization who helped me so much. Um, it was in their support groups that, in sharing with other people, I realized, realized that I could use my experiences to help others. 